So I'm going to present a little bit on the beautiful boys you see in the background. Um, you know, these are our Angus calves at WA ranches of the University of Calgary. And last year we did a project where we looked at, um, you know, beef calves at the ranch and to see whether we can uh, keep them healthy in the feedlots by making changes on the ranch. So I'm going to skip this uh, slide. It just tells you, you know, I have an identity crisis. I wear coveralls. I wear, you know, white coats. And sometimes I'm just here presenting being, I pretend to be smart. But anything I'm doing in life has to do with cattle. And, and they come in any form or shape. They make me happy. But I know today I'm talking about Angus cattle and our WA ranches has Angus, Angus cattle. So be, 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 uh, bear with me, it's, uh, it won't be about any dairy cows or anything. So what was our project aim? What did we want? Well, this is not what we want in our feedlot industries. These are obviously animals that are really heavily breathing and clearly clinically affected by bovine respiratory disease. I will, I will name that BRD from now on. And I think BRD is known by most people as the disease that really makes us use antimicrobials or antibiotics as much as we need to in the feedlots. So sometimes they get a shot on arrival and for sure when they look like this or not happy like that, uh, you know, we pull them from the pens to treat them uh, to make sure that their long, uh, lungs get healthy again and that they don't die of this pneumonia. So what does this disease in feedlots have to do with, you know, with the ranch? And like I said, can, can we just do something at the ranch that helps, um, you know, keeping the calves healthy in the feedlot? Well, that's where multidisciplinarity comes in. You know, the, the project has my name on it, but I work with a lot of people. I work with people that are way better than I am at, for example, welfare and behavior, Dr. Pager, or looking at viruses that cause BRD, like Frank Vandermeer, or Kathy Larson that knows how to calculate economics, or any other people. So it's a big group, but today I'm presenting on their behalf. So what we're doing is we're really trying to answer all these different questions. And one of the questions, for example, was the top one. Is it important for calves to learn how to eat from a bunk at the ranch so that they can have a better start at the feedlot? Or can we identify some good bacteria and good viruses that prevent calves from getting sick in the feedlots? Or how can we make more money this way by changing management and making more money? And what is the role of antimicrobial resistance? So do those bacteria that cause BRD end up um, you know, being resistant against the bacteria that we're using? So these are our big research questions and always to make sure that you guys have to uh, know engage is my question to you. What kind of things can you think of that cause stress for a calf on the ranch? Weaning. Thank you. That's a good one. What else? Temperature. Yeah. Weather. If uh, like last year, August, it wasn't uh, the nicest for everyone. Um, so heat and cold, it's there. The weather, you know, so that's definitely stressful. Unfortunately, that's something I cannot change so much. Uh, stocking density, really nice. So there's all kinds of ideas that you guys have about stress. And I think there is a lot of stressful events for calves. You know, it's uh, for the bull calves, it's also castration, you know, branding, a painful procedure, uh, moving locations. That's a nice one that comes up in the, um, there too. It's sometimes, you know, moving from one pa pasture to another or to community pastures or wherever the animals are. But even just processing through the chute can be, um, can be very stressful for animals. And I think what our main challenge is, we often do all these things at the same time. So it's not just one thing that is stressful and that might just be, you know, difficult for a calf to deal with, we do all these things at the same time. And what we've learned is that doing all these things at the same time is really not, um, not very good for calves. So what did we study? So this is our WA ranches at the University of Calgary. I think some of you might have heard about it. It's, it's a beautiful donation uh, from a family to our university. 
It is a commercial Black Angus operation, and we have about a thousand mother cows. So it's, it's sort of an aerial uh, picture of the, the environment we're working with. And last year, I was able to, um, you know, to work with the first 250 bull calves that were born at the WA ranches. So what did we do with those calves? So we try to do everything that you need to do at the ranch at the best timing possible with the least stress. So it was really all focused at doing it the best we can, but with as little stress as possible. So animals were born uh, between March and May. Most of the animals were April calves and they got intranasal vaccines on arrival. They got their ear tags uh, on arrival when they, when they were born. Um, so identification and vaccination was done right at, the, at birth. And then we processed them a little later than average. I don't know what most of you guys do uh, at home, but um, we decided to do that at 60 days average. So two months of age. That is a little bit later than most, of, most people do. But if the animals are really young, it's harder for them to deal with stress. So we wanted to push that a little bit later. Also, because vaccines given at two months of age are more likely to be effective. So they got vaccinated in June. We knife castrated them, but with pain medication. So it's still stressful, but we try to take the pain out of the equation. And they got implanted for, you know, life on pasture. Then we left them alone till September and only two animals out of my 250 calves got summer pneumonia. For the rest, I didn't see them until September. And in September, actually, the most exciting part of our study started. And what you can see here in the back sort of aligns with, you know, my background is on the right side of that fence, you see the moms. So here you have the moms and on the other side of the fence, you have the calves. So this is so-called fence line weaning. So the animals can no longer suckle with mom, but if they still want to talk to their mom, they can still say hello through the fence. And it was quite interesting. You see in my background, you know, that little guy there that is like stretched neck and bawling, but some cows were just totally fine, just every now and then checking in with mom and just be on their own. And after five days and another vaccination booster shot, we moved the, the beef calves, so our bull calves, steers by then, to another location. So that moving of animals was now separated from the stressful event weaning, and it was separated from shoot processing for vaccinations. It was spread out over a longer period of time. And by the end of September, we placed them in a pen, and for 40 days, we fed them you know, from feed bunks at the ranch. So the calves learned how to live without mom. They learned how to live not grazing on pasture, but eating from a feed bunk. And then mid-November, we moved them to the feedlot pens in, uh, in Olds. And in the feedlot pens, we, we actually added another you know, piece of the research. Um, the feedlot pens were 100 head each, and we had our 250 WA calves, but we also bought 250 calves at auction. So from those calves, we really didn't know what had happened to them. We didn't know how they were weaned, when they were weaned. Uh, we didn't know whether they vac were vaccinated. They're just your average commercial animal. And in the five pens we had, we put 100 WA calves together, 100 auction calves, but in the other pens, we mix them, 75 WA calves and 25 auction, 50-50, and a pen that was 25 WA and 75 um, um, from the auction. And what we wanted to know is that if we give calves a perfect life on the ranch, will they be less likely to get bovine respiratory disease in the feedlots? And if they're mixed in with other animals, will they still be more healthy? So now I'm going to look at the chat and I said, how large was the calf holding pen used for the fence line weaning? The fence line weaning actually um, happened in the, the pasture that uh, the cow pairs were in. So they were really not restricted for space, 
but we just had had an opportunity to put the fence line in that separated the the two groups of animals and we had to make sure there was water sources in both so the cows they, they stayed on the pasture they were already in they were just separated out in a smaller area where there was water troughs for the calves to drink so not restricted at all so what you see here in the back uh, is, you know, the feeding bunks at the ranch. So here you see my calves, you know, trying to eat and learn how to eat for 40 days before they go to here to the feedlot pens in Olds. And I'm going to show you some results, uh, but I also will be wary of the time. Give me a heads up if I talk too much. Uh, but here you can see my WA calves in red and my auction calves in yellow. And it might be a little bit busy to look at it for the first time, but here at time zero, that's when the feed truck's coming. And you can see here another zero. So morning feeding and an hour later, and then afternoon feeding uh, and an hour after. And what you can see is my WA calves right from day one, they picked up, they knew what it meant if a, if a feed truck shows up. And most of them showed up at the bunk. So 75% of all my WA calves were at the feed bunk. And my auction calves really had to clue in, like, what does it mean that a truck comes? Well, by the evening, they had a better idea because that's when they showed up. But you can see that feed intake, you know, feed bunk attendance was quite high for our, my red calves. So that tells me that it helps if you know what's, wh where you have to go for feeding. So the other components, we don't have a lot of results yet, but here you see the big setup is to take, you know, swaps from the nose of the animal to be able to culture the bacteria and to take antibodies from the blood. I do have some antibody uh, titer uh, results to uh, share with you because I told you that we vaccinated them when they were born at 60 days, then at pre uh, at um, fence line weaning, but and also here, uh, you know, we have sample moments on arrival in the feedlot. So in this uh, next one, what you can see here is five time points of antibody titers of my WA calves. And these three time points are my auction calves. So this orange one can be compared to that one, the green one to green and red to red. Um, I thought maybe this is not the, the, the easiest to, to show, so I'm just going to show this slide and then I'm going to answer the question. Is This is just one of the many, many results we have. This is looking at IBR, so titers against herpes virus. And you can see here that at processing, the WA calves presented in red are very high. They go a little bit lower at weaning, but they were all still quite high. And then on arrival in the feedlot, they got boosted and kaboom, the titers, you know, really go up nicely and the animals are protected against BRD. But my auction calves on arrival had really low titers and it took quite a while for them to respond to the booster vaccine that they, that they received on arrival, or at least the vaccine, to be able to also be protected. And they were only protected by day 40 in the feedlot. So what were they vaccinated with? I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to, uh, to use brands. I don't know if it's really about brands, but uh, it's more like we use the intranasal vaccines at day zero, so at birth, as well as at day 60. And we vaccinated them against IBR and BBD and other viral uh, components uh, for BRD. But we also included a clostridial vaccine like most people do but we, we didn't test for that. We really looked at the, uh, the BRD uh, viruses. So to wrap it up and to stay a, a little bit within time limits, um, we also you know, used cow manager tags. These are tags that you can, uh, can clip in their ears that can tell you how much they ruminate, how much they feed, how much they lie down. That is all still information that I have to analyze. We haven't done that yet. But we also took a sample of the hair from the hip and that hair sample might tell us a little bit about how stressful life has been up till then. And that is uh, measured with cortisol. So can I answer my big question? Like, you know, does that preconditioning, that better life on the ranch, give us healthier uh, calves in the feedlot? 
Well, we don't know everything yet, but I can tell you for health, pretty much yes. My WA pen did way better than the others, but we also really noticed things on behavior like animals were surely easier to work with. But there's lots more data to come. And I hope that, you know, through your um, network, you will hear more about the results of our study. So I, I hope I answered the questions that were um, that were asked during my presentation. But if there is time, then uh, I would love to uh, see uh, if I can answer more. I see Naomi, you you provided a question. Do you think producers will be paid a premium in the future uh, for incorporating pre-weaning vaccinations that allow the calves to adapt better, or more research is needed? So the challenge is, is that, and one of the reasons I'm, I added that component about mixing the animals in the pens in oats is that the science already tells us that calves will do better if they're preconditioned. But feedlot owners currently don't want to pay extra. And one of the reasons we think is because in pens, they're often mixed in with, with auction calves because there is not enough preconditioned calves or calves are preconditioned slightly differently. So that, you know, the extra premium you pay, you don't get the returns because if they're mixed in with calves that all get sick, ultimately your preconditioned calves will also get sick. So that is, that is hopefully results that we get that we can show that it gives benefits to uh, even if you mix and mingle at the feedlot level. Okay, that was uh, my contribution. So I will stop sharing and uh, I will stay on if there's people that wanna ask questions, I will keep my eye out on the chat box. Thank you.